So in the first two years of trying to do a side business, I made about eight thousand dollars, and in the first um, what was it? in the first ninety days of having a mentor that taught me how to do paid ads properly, I made a hundred and seven k. So big difference. At Founder, we're leading an educational revolution and training the entrepreneurs of tomorrow. In this series, we're talking to our own students to discover how they're building the businesses of their dreams. These are real everyday people who have made it happen. Now, before we jump in, our lawyers have told us to tell you this. Of course, we can't guarantee you'll have the results like some of our stories are about to share in the show. And as you know, with any business, it's a lot of hard work in addition to completing any online course. And with that said, welcome to From Zero to Founder. Hey guys, Molly here. I'm the community manager for Founder Magazine and welcome back to the series From Zero to Founder. I'm sitting down speaking with Gumal Kodna, who is one of our Start and Scale students, who has managed to launch a business, go from zero to 60K in 90 days, and is now surpassing a million dollars a month, which is just incredible. It's a really interesting story that I think you'll love listening to. So let's welcome Gumal to the podcast. Hey, Gumal, welcome. Why not start by introducing yourself? Um, a little bit about myself. I am a Jamaican born, now entrepreneur for about 10 years, about uh, eight years fully. And I did a couple of things in corporate sales in a few years back, just really hated what I was doing, even though I was well compensated. And I just desired to learn a skill. And from a long time ago, I've been real big on just investing in the knowledge of others instead of just learning the hard way, speeding up my learning curve, because time is our most valuable asset. So I just got some mentors in the digital marketing space and had an agency for a while helping other brands uh, grow online through paid social. And I did that enough. And about four years ago, I decided to launch my own brand. And my it's a family owned brand. My wife and I run it daily. And we sell grooming products to African American men, men with multi ethnic hair that have unique hair needs. And yeah, so that was around the time I also found about found out about founder and some of the cool stuff you guys were doing. So I knew I knew marketing, but didn't know a whole lot. There's so much to e-commerce. And once again, didn't want to go learning the hard way. So I just decided to jump in the community and it's been great ever since. Amazing. And I definitely agree with you. There's so much knowledge out there and kind of investing in yourself and investing in that knowledge is definitely key. You mentioned you had your agency. Were you working purely with e-commerce brands in that agency or was it a, a variety of different businesses? This was like 2014 when we started. So at that time, 2013 actually. So at that time, you know, e-commerce, I think everything is really e-commerce. You, you, it's, you know, you talk to people online or you communicate with them without doing it in person and you get them to transact, whether your call to action is to come in and buy in retail. But I mean, having some sort of online presence to funnel people into getting your product. It's all e-commerce, whether it's physical product or digital product. But at the time, e-commerce wasn't that big and it was really a, a early market. So we did a couple of things, but towards the end, I had the most success and had the most fun with the e-commerce brands I represented. So that's what allowed, that's what made me want to go into the e-commerce route to do my own thing versus some of the other brands. The good thing was that I got a bird's eye view of a whole lot of industries using paid ads. And I saw kind of the trends of e-commerce. And so I knew that's something I kind of wanted to go into. Incredible. And you mentioned paid ads. Is that something from your background you've always kind of had experience in and from, you know, wanting to start your own business, you learned more and more about? Yeah. So that was a skill I thought could um, take me away from corporate America. And I was right. So in the first two years of trying to do a side business, I made about $8,000. And in the first, um, what was it? In the first 90 days of having a mentor that taught me how to do paid ads properly, I made 107K. So big difference. And so um, that's the thing that eventually took me away from corporate America. And this is the thing that has been able to allow me to feed my family every month. And I learned that skill first and I offered it as a, as a service to other people. But I realized that, you know, paid ads is a great way to leverage what you're doing, but there are other ways to leverage what you're doing too. And so, and I'm of the belief that if you have a product that you think is good and in person you can sell and you can do a lot with it, then leverage is the only thing standing from your revenue goals. And so what I like about paid ads is I could be a nobody with no social following and just learn how to do some things online to have my product who I know people would like 
I know who the certain type of people is who may like my product, I could put up little virtual billboards. And so I can have one working for me in Atlanta, one in Australia, one in New York, and I can monitor them and get in front of the right people at different places around the world. And if the Atlanta one starts doing bad, I could just turn that one off. And so it allows me to leverage my product and help me to put my product in front of pretty much anyone I want to worldwide. So with a good product, any kind of leverage, whether it be through social or paid social or ads or what have you, just allows you to get your brand out in front of more people. And if you have a good product, it'll help you grow your brand faster. I think that's a really interesting take on paid ads, having almost like a, a virtual billboard, because it is in fact that, like you mentioned, it's having different advertisements popping up all around the world and where you want to target them and exactly who you want to target them as well. So based off having this side hustle that you started, you know, getting that income coming in, what made you go towards beard oils to begin with? It Was it always an idea that you had um, from experience or? Yeah, um, good question. And just some context, I don't want to get too nerdy, but I coach people on the paid ad side, like not like a mega course thing, but more like a handful of people at a time and we work intimately. And so one of the things with paid ads is people are like, man, these ads aren't working. And usually when the ads aren't working, it has nothing to do with the ads. It's really about the lack of product market fit or the lack of, hey, does this product serve a need or solve a pain point? So I have this concept called the three Ps, person, pain, and promise. It's essentially what specific person does your product benefit and can improve their lives? And what specific pain point in that specific person does your product go after? And what promise can you make that person about that specific pain? And so I bring all that up to say uh, beard oil in that concept of like what we're doing is because although it seems very general, it's like a very basic need. I figured out that as a man of color, it was very hard for me to find products for myself because most products on the market had like general products, like large brands, they have alcohol content in the, in the ingredient list. And that is absolutely horrible for people with hair like mine. And so that was one side of the battle. The other side was that the products who has, have historically been made for African-American people, um, there was a recent study that showed one in every 12 products out of like over a thousand products um, reviewed, highly hazardous products in the contents. And so we're, I was in this place where I either got things that were bad for my hair or not made for my hair type, or if I went to the things that were made for my hair type, I risked like putting my body in danger. And so um, I have found myself using female products because there are products made for female African-Americans who were in the right mix. And so I was like, man, why am I using all these pink bottles in my grooming? There needs to be something who spoke more closely to me. And so that's kind of where my three P's evolved from is like, all right, I can help uh, men of color with my, with beards, with my hair needs, um, solve the pain point of having to choose between things that aren't made for them or things that are made for them that are potentially dangerous or things that are made for women. Um, I can help them with their grooming needs. And so that was kind of where it settled on the problem to go solve. I was really just trying to solve a problem for me and realize that other people had the same problems too. So those are usually the good problems to go after. Things so, that are close to yourself. Yeah, of course, because you have to be passionate about something and that's where the true growth will really come from and finding a gap in the market. But also, as you mentioned, having the three Ps, I think that's really interesting because it's almost like validating your product before you're bringing it out to anyone to be validated by. So from the beginning, when did you first launch Fresh Heritage, your uh, beard oil? Mm, we officially launched May of 2017. And it took me a couple months before that to like finally get the idea off the ground. In 2016, I just spent some time with a tech startup. We raised some money in Silicon Valley and stuff. And um, it, we shut it down, didn't work well. But I learned so much from like tech startups and how they think about, this is where I got this concept of three piece from, how they think about like using technology to solve a problem. And so I just kind of had this problem that I overlooked and I'm like, hmm, what if I can use something less than technology to, but still solve a problem for people? So it took me a couple of months to, cause I knew nothing about like manufacturing and none of that. So I found a, a thing about um, tech is people have strong skill sets and they usually find other people in other areas. So if you're like good with development and coding, you may find someone who's good at fundraising or like UX or UI. And so I use that same concept. I was good at marketing. I knew I had this problem. I had to find someone who's fortunately a biochemist with a African-American biochemist with a massive beard. 
who was solving this problem from for himself for a few years, just on a personal level. And so I borrowed a lot of his research and advice. And um, actually in 2016, to celebrate what we were doing, my brothers and I took a trip to Morocco. And during that time, we just learned about our heritage and um, we took some stuff back from them. So we were actually, part of the reason this brand is, I think, really cool and unique is that all our ingredients are founded on those traditions that we discovered. So all of our products are have ingredients who are inspired by African or Caribbean uh, diaspora. And so um, we kind of pay homage and tradition to all of our heritage in a modern twist way. And so that guy was able to help bring all of the, the actual product market fit to life. And so I just built a team and took about six months to bring it to life. I find that really, really interesting. And I'm sure people listening will. And I love that you've gone and you had that trip with your brothers because a lot of people will appreciate, I guess, the founder story as well behind the brand, which is a very important message. Is that something that you really wanted to portray to your audience as well is the connection between you yourself as well as the brand and the product? Yes. Um, you know, in a busy highly competitive marketplace, you usually don't have to be better than your competition, but you do have to be different. You have to give people a reason to try you because we're oftentimes competing for that first sale. Uh, if you have a good product and they try it, you'll continue to have great customers. And like one of our, we're just looking at the stats now, our best, our highest, um, our highest lifetime value customer has bought from us 46 times over the past two years. And we have dozens, hundreds, thousands of people who are, have bought more than once. And so that part speaks for itself. But how do we get that person to try us out for the first time? And oftentimes, if we're small, nimble with a very small budget, it's the founder story or the brand story. It's about what uniqueness about myself or our journey or our founder story that resonates with that 3P, the person, pain, and promise. You know, if there are many brands who come out and they say, oh, it's like, oh, they're just trying to. Um, culture, culture vultures and just things like that. Like people are just jumping in with the ideas of trying to resonate with someone, but having a, an honest founder story and a background to like let people know that, hey, I had the same problem that you had and here's all the depths of details we went to solve this problem for ourselves. And now we have made this solution available for you. Really helped connect with people on the front end. And we knew once they tried our product, um, they would just continue to rock with us and build a really good community. As a community manager myself, I definitely applaud you because community is very strong. And as you mentioned, you can have that real bond with the, the 46 times coming back is just incredible. And I'd love to speak to you more about that. But following back on when you first launched, you did have some success before you even found the founder course, the Start and Scale course. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I knew the importance of um, building a team from some of my experiences in my previous startup. Also, I think early on in this interview, I talked about, I understood the benefits of having great self-awareness, realizing what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. And um, I had some limited, I had some success coming out the gate building. So I built a great team, built up a good idea, thought it was good, great product market fit. I started small, started a local. So we had um, a local launch and collected I gathered a lot of the local influencers and thought leaders and got a lot of press and um, just local inertia around there. And so we built up a lot of good momentum. But then I ran into other issues. Like I knew nothing about influencers. I didn't, I had very little knowledge on how to like the operation side of running a business. So yeah, we jump out the gate, we make a lot of sales, but oh crap, now I have to actually figure out a way to fulfill these orders. Um, so it was just a lot of other learnings that I needed. And so, you know, a successful e-commerce brand is like a three-legged stool, right? If you go too hard in one direction, it'll tilt the chair over. And so everything has to be balanced. As you ramp up sales, you've got to know how to fulfill. You've got to know how to um, continue having um, high, um, high quality of customer support. And so I've, I was looking for more solutions to the things that I knew nothing about. And I think that's when I came across uh, you guys. Amazing. And I definitely agree with you. There's so many different avenues that you can go down when it comes to e-commerce, especially in today because social media is just skyrocketing and so is influencers both macro and micro. So when you were trying to focus on improving, I guess, the, the areas that you weren't as confident in, in your learnings and your education, what was the main tool besides, 
um, you know, influencers that you really took from the Start and Scale course that helped you grow in the first couple of months? Influencers was definitely one. Um, just being a part of a community of other people on the journey was super helpful. I've connected with some really dope individuals like in the first 90 days of the course that I still connect with now. Um, we, I think it's, we all know that I won like the, one of the fastest growing brands in the course and I got a chance to meet the guys at Founder and Greta and some other people. I still keep in touch with everyone that I met on that trip. So just like that's essentially priceless. And um, one of the, so influencers, connections, and then just like overall store management, just like what apps I need, like how to hire people, how to reach out to people, just a lot of things. I, I just knew marketing. I was very strong at marketing and this taught me how to be a CEO of a brand. And so just, just a lot of just things that you can't even put your finger on, but just helpful. Just having someone to reach out to, having someone to be on the same journey for, with you, just updates with new apps or how to fulfill orders, just like random stuff. Incredible. And from, uh, I guess, prior to the course and after taking the course, you had quite the significant jump in revenue monthly. Would you like to touch upon that as well? Yeah, I, I can't remember the specific numbers. It's been four years, but I think I went from like zero to like very, like maybe 10K total revenue to like 60K a month in 90 days. And so, um, Part of the reason that I was very successful with that was because, um, like I told you, I knew paid ads, my concept of leverage, using paid ads to do something that's working really well. And the thing that I was looking for when I came in the course was influencers. And so I kind of realized and understood how the value proposition, what the value prop is for influencers, how to manage them. And I linked up with a local influencer um, who fit the bill and I knew what I needed to persuade and like convince people who were on the fence about my product because I, I did the surveys, w w which they talked about in early on in the course. So I understood what my customers um, pain points were and what they were hesitant on with doing business with me. And I got it to work at a local level and I just put a lot of ads behind it. And so our first influencer video that we took just like regular user generated content on an iPhone ended up getting a couple million views in our first year. And that one iPhone video over the years has contributed to over a half a million dollars in revenue. Wow, that's amazing. What, like from that learning, have you stuck to using user-generated content in your ad creatives or have you tested a few other different um, creatives angles? So I've tried different things throughout the years, but, and everything kind of ebbs and flows. It's like people don't want to be sold to, they just want to buy. And so, it's one of those things where, you know, just in general marketing, when everyone's zigging, you should zag. Cause if you start, it's again, the concept of you don't need to be better. You just need to be different. And so when everyone's doing a certain type of thing, people are aware that this is what's happening. And so right now there seems to be a swing back to more natural user generated content because people are so aware of their, them being sold to like everything's in 4k and just looking highly professional. And the, the concept of influencers and people being paid to say stuff and it's, it's just very well known. And so the more, we still utilize influencers to um, get our message across. 90% of our influencers we use are actual customers. So like that was important to us too, like to get people who actually really believe in the product and um, it just helps. And so sometimes it may be like, oh, that guy, we see him on your website. We're like, yeah. like. He's a real customer who happens to also authentically like our products. And um, that was a thing. And so we just found that that worked best for us recently, just continuing to do really raw, unedited iPhone type quality stuff, catching natural reactions to people who genuinely like our products, not as much for paid people. The only benefit is with paid people is that um, kind of rookies are people who are not used to being in camera they get so nervous and they start saying crap that doesn't even like isn't true or they a whole lot of ums and maybes and so it's a little bit of a time commitment to get there and they get nervous they need to have haircuts and they're just not ready so sometimes if you work with someone who's used to being in camera and clearly articulating the pain points that helps a little bit better but um, if we do use that we try not to have it be overly produced and still have that user-generated feel 
I feel like that's really great advice for anyone listening as well when they are approaching influencers because there are a lot of different aspects that you have to focus on, not just getting the revenue in in your pocket. Having that brand transparency, I think that you touched upon is really key because some of the other companies I've worked for in the past, when you use almost ambassadors, it definitely highlights your brand as something that's more genuine. And I feel like your brand Fresh Heritage going about that route is really, really interesting. And how have you managed to scale with influencers? You touched upon in ads and creatives. Have you continued using it because it's a proven method for you now? Yeah, I think it's very important to say starting off, one of the lessons I've found is that it is much better to start local and to have like a fewer super fans and just people who really buy into what the brand is doing versus just trying to swing for the bat and just having people all over spread out and people, you know, just not really buying into who you are. And I'll say that explained for a few reasons. Early on, we, you know, it's like building a, mo- it's like building momentum. And so it's much easier to manage just locally. If I highlight a list, it, it helps if you're in a large city and I, I launched the brand in Atlanta, which there are a lot of my target demo in the city, but any major city can do this. Build a list of 50 people locally and you actually like go and try to meet them in real life. Reach out to them, ask for a minute for coffee, bring them over. And we would have like pool parties and just like really cool social things to just like 10, 20 people. Or we'd like um, sponsor um, drinks on us for just a happy hour social and we'll partner with the local bar, have 50 guys come through. And we just built like authentic relationships and bonds with us so that we actually understood our customers. And then when we did have an ask, it was like they were doing it for a friend. And we, we had a very important conversation with anyone, which is our why and our founder story, why we started this. So we almost had like walk-in billboards when any of these people had someone who were an ideal customer, they had a relationship with the founder, knew what we're about, knew that we were people of high integrity and knew what our brand's mission was and knew that we were serving a bigger purpose. And so we got a lot of our um, influencers who were really just ended up being friends. And a lot of the people we worked with in year one, we still turn to to get stuff from in year four, just because of the investment that we put in early on. We don't have a lot of like super celebrities as our influencers or or, our brands, but we do have people who are micros or nanos that really believe in our product and really are ambassadors that so much so that they turn down offers from other people who are willing to pay them just because it was a conflict and they knew that they knew what we were doing and by them partnering with other people would take away from what we were doing. And we didn't ask them to. And that's just the kind of relationship that we built with these people because we've invested in the long-term building a relationship. I think that's a very smart way to do it. And networking just in general, as you mentioned previously, is a massive thing that you want to focus on. And I think it's a really great thing for all, if not most companies should definitely try and, and focus on. You mentioned earlier how you've grown, you grew significantly with significantly within the first 90 days. Before COVID, I would really love to touch upon that, but how are you performing when you were able to do these social events, have those interactions where you were sponsoring happy hours? How did that help grow the brand before COVID hit? Yeah, it's something I've touched on before, but I always thought that was a key differentiator in how we were able to do things. And you know, when everyone's zigging, you should zag. And so I noticed the trend of everything being online, like so much so that people would be in the same space and all like communicating on, on their phone. There's this funny meme, like this guy in a bar looking at like a, a a really attractive girl. And he's like online trying to get her attention versus just having a conversation in person. And so I just, I was just like, Hey, let's just get to know people. And so we partnered with other local businesses who um, had the same, like mission statement and had the same common purpose and we had the best events and it was just like one of the people one of the type of things that we realized is that the type of users who bought our product were like partners at law firms like just go-getters trailblazers so we just created an environment where we would just have them in and say hey like we're in, we don't have any products here to sell this is not about that this is the fact that we have such dope people in our community and we want to share and foster like collaboration with other people who are supporting us. We want to, this is our way of supporting you. So here's a free networking event, meet cool people, have a free drink on us. And it really helped a lot. 
Like those are the kind of things that allowed people to buy multiple times with us because they were bought into what we we're trying to do, like the bigger picture. And also it did grow revenue because at there, the only thing that we would capture is the user generated content. We got a chance to meet customers. Some customers would like drive two and a half hours away to like come and meet us and just participate. And so we got a chance to like get content from them or review. And it just really helped funnel through our emails, our ads and some of the other things. So it was a tool that kept on giving. It was a great way for us to gather organically and to create content from it. At Founder, 99% of our content is free. Today's episode is only made possible by our incredible student community, from our magazine to subscribers to the entrepreneurs enrolling in our course programs. If you are thinking of finally starting your own business, make sure to check out the exact free training that led today's guests to where they are now. Head to founder.com slash e-commerce training or follow the link in the show notes. Did you also find from doing these events, if you were able to get any contact information or things like that, it also grew email lists or any other channels that you were pouring energy into? That wasn't the most effective way for us to grow our like owned media, email, SMS. But what that that was a really effective way for us to get ideas on like product launches. Like we had people who were driving two hours away this guy would surely take the time to give us honest feedback about things that were like our product roadmap or how to make updates to existing products, et cetera. So that was a really effective way to do that as well. Incredible. And how did COVID impact you, your business and everything like that? Because it has been quite crazy over in the U S compared to what it is in Australia. So I'd love to hear that side of the story. Yeah. You know, at the start of COVID, we kind of made a decision that it was a lot of uncertainty. And if we were going to go through this, we wanted it to be a fast death. We didn't want to have like a long drawn out death. So we're like, all right, we can BS this thing, keep it slow and see how we end up in six months, or we can just fail fast. And just, we just really increased our advertising spend. We increased the products that we like launch more products last year than we ever had and um, launch additional products we've been setting on the timeline on that we've been sitting on um, in our time frame, And so we did that. In addition to that, I moved, sold the house, relocated the business, had a baby. And so last year was a, just a crazy year for us, but it turned out good. Wow, that's incredible. It's quite the story. The bet worked, by the way. So we ended up not failing fast and ended up um, seeing some significant growth in the midst of all the other stuff. So I wouldn't recommend the next pandemic, anyone choose to have a baby, sell a house, move, move a business, get a new place and all that, and like significantly grow your business, so. I can imagine it would be quite quite a big change and, uh, and a lot of different business and personal. But I think that's amazing that you managed to scale because like you mentioned, you could have just quit and put your hands in the air and gave up or you can 10X and really push your business further. You mentioned you have launched other products and I believe you've got your beard oil, you've got gummy vitamins and shampoo and conditioner, is that correct? I am a big fan of um, less is more and don't let great be the enemy of good. And so for about at least over a year, I forgot the exact time frame, but I only sold one single product and um, people were so surprised, but I just wanted to be known for like the best thing and I can... I can safely say that the comments that we get from our product, we worked on it, we reiterated, we we changed that thing maybe five or six times and we confidently have the best beard oil for men of color, like by far. People leave comments all the time, like I've literally tried 20 other things and once I found your product, like I no longer need to search. This is the best thing I've ever had. So we just wanted to get good at one thing and then earn that trust and then launch additional products based on customer feedback. So we have now, the other thing is most of our customers are busy and men generally don't spend, invest as much time in taking care of themselves. So we wanted to create as few products as possible that can serve the most variety of customers. And so we have African-American men with a bunch of different hair textures, a bunch of different hair lens. So we just really created three products that could groom your hair on your head, on your beard, if it's short, if it's long, if it's curly, if it's straight, if it's dry, if it's moist. And so those are our first products, the beard oil, conditioner, and shampoo. And then we launched some supplements as well to help men who, like, there are two types of customers. There are people who want to grow a beard, 
and people who already have a beard and want to just maintain it better. So the supplements are more for people who are just starting off and don't want to go through like the ugly phase of having a really patchy beard. They can take our products and kind of speed up that process and get to like a desirable, like glamorous beard in a shorter amount of time. Incredible. And I think it's great that you've almost diversified the range of products that you have, but you did mention you wanted to do really, really well at the one thing. And I think you absolutely smashed it, as you've said. What was the revenue like when you were just doing your beard oil? What was what were you bringing in before you made the choice to bring in those other products? Yeah, I don't remember exactly. But like when we were doing, we went from zero to 60K in a month. It was like one product. So it was like 60K worth of one $25 item. And I think we got up to like six figures doing that too, like in a monthly basis. Um, but revenue and average order value and all that stuff has significantly increased since then. Incredible. And do you have any subscription services or anything like that, that you add to your products for your repeat customers? Yep. So about 41% of our revenue comes from people who have bought before. So like I said, we're really big on just serving the hell out of our few cut, like managing what we have instead of trying to just focus on trying to get new, new, new and mismanaging the current people. So that guy that I talked about who's ordered from us 46 times in two years, I forgot to say that it's only been two years. Um, he is on subscription and we do intentional things to uh, keep people on our subscription program. Like the number one thing is we don't call it subscription. We call it a membership. Um, subscription has a negative connotation and from our research, um, our demographic like being a part of membership societies and membership societies, the connotation has additional benefits. So we redesigned our membership program um, to just design it in a way that would be appealing and serve the needs of our customers. That may not work for everybody. You need to really talk to your customers. Remember person pain promise and each person in your demo may have a different need and um, just different lifestyle stuff. So we did a couple of things to help push our membership program and that helps, but really the biggest thing to grow repeat business is just having a good, like a good freaking product. And so if you have a product, you, you don't really need to convince people to buy more of it. You just need to make it convenient for them to be able to get more when they want it. And so that would be our biggest, like our biggest learning is if you want to grow your membership program, have a really good product that serves a problem and just make it convenient for people to keep that very convenient product that solves a big pain point for them in, in, in their house. Incredible, incredible insight. From the membership program, did you notice people when you launched your shampoo and conditioner that were on that membership program just go straight towards your new product and invest in that as well because they believed in the brand? I did. A lot of our launches come from people who are already on our list and we do, we're intentional about certain things. So like a proper launch, we may be warming people up who have bought from us. We like segment our customers of people who bought from us more than once, people who've set, spent over a certain amount of money, people who've left, a, left us a five-star review. We've got like 2,700 um, positive reviews. And so we have like intentionality about how we launch things. And so also um, one of the things that are important are letting your community know that you, you hear them. So we would sometimes have polls and say, hey, we're thinking about this, which products should we prioritize and why? And then based on the feedback, we'll like reach back out to those people and say, pretty much say, hey, Molly, we listened to you that we should have the shampoo. Um, would you like to be first in line to get your hands on it when we launch? And so just being intentional about just building a community, letting them know that you, they are heard and being intentional about your, your launches, which I know you guys have talked about strategies for product launches too. So um, some of these listeners should know what, which, what we're talking about. Exactly. And having that brand loyalty, as you've mentioned time and time again, is something that definitely helps you scale. What would you say it takes for someone listening to get to where you are today? Maybe that could be stuck in similar ways where they're trying, they're really good at marketing, but they're trying to evolve their ideas and really kind of get more products in their store. I would say the most expensive thing right now for that person but the biggest delta stand in between where they are and where they like to be is lack of information. Um, that is really the differentiator. There's so much, there's so many people out there who have figured stuff out 
that I guarantee whatever issue you're going through right now, whatever roadblock, whether it be supply chain, manufacturing, marketing, conversion, what have you, other people have been through it, right? And and so things become routine to other people. So I'd say the, the, the biggest thing, uh, the biggest advice is to get with someone who you feel has figured out what you need to figure out and figure out how to get their help. Like whether it be through following a YouTube channel, watching interviews like this, or being a part of a course or just reaching out and like being a part of a coaching program. So um, that would be one thing. And the second thing is a mind shift, a mind shift change, which is like if you're building a brand versus building a drop shipping business or just an overnight thing, it's going to happen a lot slower than you think, right? It's like the five year overnight success story. Building a brand is like building, renovating a house that you're, you plan on living in for the next 10 years versus a drop shipping store is just like getting a house, renovating for a flip. You don't take shortcuts. You take the long-term passage. And so early on, you have to really sacrifice profits for doing what's right in the long-term vision of the brand and treating your customers good and having that a long-term relationship with them. May in, it may involve investing early on and you possibly not making as much money as you think you should be making early, early on, but know that it's going to come back exponentially in the long run. And overall, if you think about building a brand that way, not taking shortcuts, you, when it comes time to sell, you're just going to have a much better just exit opportunity. If you have something that you've been intentional about from the day, from day one. I agree. And it goes back again to that passion for what you're doing and the love for what you're doing. And um, I think that is really, really important insight as well that you've touched upon. But following back to your shampoo and conditioner as well as your, your supplements, how long did it take between launching two products and then three? So in there's like ups and downs. We lost our ad account for like a whole year and everything sucked. Everything was horrible. And then 2019, we started doing better. And then towards the end of 2019, we pretty much like relaunched the brand. So we switched out the products. We owned our own manufacturing. We did a whole lot of stuff, completely new products. And we had in-person events, got pulling from customers and we relaunched. So before that we had maybe uh, one beard oil, and vitamins so from 2017 through 2019 we had three products so that's how long it took to launch that wow. and then from november december 2019 when we relaunched to like summer of last year we launched a new beard oil scent we launched shampoo we launched conditioners we launched um, other kits and we launched additional supplements. So like I said, when COVID hit, we just were like, yo, screw this. Let's, let's go out, let's go out swinging. And so we launched about six or seven different products in six months and it took us two years prior to launch three products. Wow. That's actually incredible. I didn't know how quickly that was. That's something to definitely be proud of, especially as you mentioned during that, that one of the hardest times that you've probably had to face so far and moving and having a child and all of that on top of it is just quite incredible. But from 2017, 2019, when you launched your supplements, were you ever worried about the receptive feedback or anything? Or were you pretty confident that you, you found a product that your brand w would be loyal to your customers? That's an amazing question. I think most people think about it wrong. Um, the people who I coach on ads, like this is a big problem for them too, because, um, I think most people try to sell too early. And so from my experience with a tech startup, how they think about launching new products is that you actually want to fail. You want to, you want to get no's from people. And I have a podcast on Shopify masters where I'm talking about for like an hour about this whole concept of negative framing and how people try to sell before they get feedback. When I am launching something, I actually want to find people that say no. And I have this like, idea concept called the ugly baby syndrome in that um, if I had an ugly baby, I would have no idea if my baby was ugly because people who are acts would recognize the relationship I have with my baby and not want to hurt my feelings because most people are decent people. Same thing happens with your business. And so 
when you have a business, you're usually talking to your significant others about your idea, you're investing time, energy, money, and they don't want to tell you it's a bad idea, but like, that's what you need to hear. Cause unlike a real baby, like you can do something about your business and them coddling you and just letting you know, it's not letting you know, it's a piece of crap. The sooner they do that, the better, the sooner you can make those changes and then find success. Like if, you know, Greta said something a while back that if you um, are not completely embarrassed by the first version of your product, you took too long to launch. And she got that quote from, I think, Peter Thiel or someone, but she, I, I saw her say that and I'm like, that's so true. People want this like perfect thing, like ready to sell. Like what you need to do is launch and get feedback from your customers, let know what, learn what sucks, make those changes. And then by like version three or four, maybe you have something that's ready to scale. But when I launch products early on, I want to know what's wrong with it. I want to know how bad it is, why it sucks. And I make those improvements before I like scale to the masses, which is also why it's important to have a solid list of people who really believe in the brand that you can send the crappy stuff to and get honest feedback from them, right? And so when tech companies do it, they launch, you know, Apple launches a new thing, the, the phone without the button or the, the um, AirPods without the cords. Their super users go and use it and they get feedback and then they make updates. And that's why they don't launch an iOS 14 update all at once. They launch it to certain people, call it an alpha test, make the changes, fix the bugs. And then by the time the rest of the world gets it, we're on a, you know, a couple of versions of modifications. I think e-com brands should do the same when they're launching products and learn to sell a little later in the process. Just look for product validation and improvements early on. That is such solid advice. And I hope everyone listening to this definitely writes that down because I couldn't agree with it more. It's like, why launch with something that you, you take so much time to make perfect, but then you might think it's perfect and then you test it with your audience and they might not like the scents or the flavors or whatever it may be. So really, really solid advice. I definitely agree with you on that one. And the biggest oh. problem with that too, because um, I want to make this point is that um, it's like the sunken cost fallacy. And so if you spend so much time up front making all these changes, you probably spent a crap ton of money and just telling everyone you're going to do this, you are more reluctant to make the necessary changes because you're weighing all the investment that you took to make these changes up front. So if you go in with something really nimble and crafty, there's less commitment for you to stick with that. And there's more opportunity for you to be nimble and um, uh, be open to feedback about your product. So it just wins for a lot of different reasons. I agree. Do you feel like you've kind of got a proven method to test new products now and that's how you're able to roll out six, seven new products? I think so, but I mean, they all don't work, but I'm, I think, I think, yes, I do have a proven method. Like I've launched other businesses like the ad agency, this, this coaching thing. And it's all kind of the same thing. It's like the same philosophy to launch and products, um, figure out who you're going to be hyper specific and meaningful to figure out their needs, try to create something that's different. Um, build up a pre a pre list of people who you think this would be the best for. Survey them, let them know you're thinking about working on this thing in a negative frame. And hey, I'm thinking about working on this, launching this product, launching this course, doing this agency, what have you. But um, launching this coaching program, but it's going to take me a lot of time and it's going to take me a lot of energy and resources. I don't even think people really want this. Would someone like you be interested in something like this? No, right? And you try to make it easy for them to like dismiss the idea that you're working on. If it's really easy to dismiss, then you probably are not, you know, like you haven't figured it out yet. But if what you want to find is like something called authentic demand in which when people think that you're trying to shut down this idea, they have like resistance and they're like, oh no, actually you should make this product because I've been using your product and this is the only thing that I'm missing. Like I think something like this would be helpful or no, you should like start coaching people because sometimes I feel lost and maybe co courses aren't for me or no, maybe you should launch this course because blah 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 and so it's the same thing with everything that i launch you just like the same process and then once you find that proven method you have a, like some um early adapters and then you like scale it to the masses based on the feedback from the early adapters and they allow you to like make it more perfect i agree and i believe as an entrepreneur you have to be open to changing your your path and not be so rigid and set on a plan because there are so many things that are being developed today, tomorrow, even in the future that will help you. And if you're stuck in those ways, then how are you ever gonna scale? And I think you've definitely gone about it the right way with educating yourself. Do you find that when you go to launch a new product or if you were to start a new business, you would definitely reflect back on the Start and Scale course? Yeah, I think I think the Start and Scale, start and scale course is a 
great um, foundation for this stuff. I have found a couple of other nuances along the way. So I've kind of like taken the foundation, made it my own thing. So now I have it figured out uh, with my own thing that built on what I learned. But I also would say I just bought like, I bought additional courses from you too. Like I'm, I'm big in just self-education. I want to learn as much as I can from smart people. So I've taken, you know, a little hodgepodge of information from other things that I've gotten from other courses, talking with other people and just like my own experience now. So um, now I would probably work with what I've, I've developed over the years, but I, it's definitely built on the foundation. Um, a large part of it's what I've learned through this course and others. So Incredible. And if anything, from listening to this, you've had massive, massive successes and working towards wrapping up. Do you have a goal for Fresh Heritage in terms of revenue? You're at six figures now. What is the next goal? Good question. So fortunately, um, we have surpassed a lot of the goals I originally set for it. And um, I think the next goal on our like roadmap is to actually exit the brand. Um, we were intentional early on that we want to build something that we can get to a certain level. And now I think we're at the point where as an entrepreneur, just being honest with your what you're good and what you're good at, what you're good at and what you're not good at. I know that the brand has potential to reach other places and my skill sets are probably not the best skill sets to take it to that next level. So I think the next kind of big milestone for us would be to find someone who can take what we've built and take it into like the dream brand that we think this has a potential to be. So I think that would be a pretty cool um, experience to go through and find in a potential like good fit and a good home for the brand to hit newer heights. Thank you for that transparency because, you know, it is something that entrepreneurs and business owners, CEOs have to face sometimes where they have that kind of realization where they, they know it's destined for bigger things. And like you have a child now and you've moved and you might be onto other, other ventures. For anyone listening, what were some of the goals that you've had that might inspire them if it was getting X amount of sales in this time? Was it reaching the six figures for you or was it the million dollar mark? I think it is important to set realistic goals that continue to um, feed you rewards and then set them higher. So I did have an idea of like um, selling a million dollars of beer oil. And fortunately we've hit that. And um, you know, 10 K months, hundred K months, all that other stuff, like having a team of a certain amount of people. So um, we've been fortunate to hit pretty much all of our goals so far um, with the support of all the people around us. But I think some realistic goals for people are just like getting your first sale, getting a 10K month, um, hitting a six figure month, hitting seven figure as a brand overall, and um, just rewarding yourself when you do that. And so the course has been helpful in um, one, just giving me their foundation to build off of, two, seeing other people who have hit it. Like some, some of the guys I've um, met from the group, they did $30 million last year. And I'm like, holy crap. Well, I should say they did $3 million a month annualized. It's over $30 million. So I hadn't followed up to figure out like what they close off at. But just seeing like a real person who's doing this stuff and getting access to the insights that they were doing just helps you to appreciate the journey you've come on and then also realize that you can keep pushing yourself. So for anyone listening to this, whatever your goal is, like stick to it. Don't feel compelled to try to make your goal bigger just because other people are doing it but still be inspired to realize that, you know, myself or that person doing $3 million is literally no different than you if you're home listening. It's just, we have access to for information and we created a product that serve a specific group of people. And we surrounded ourselves with people who can help us hit those goals and surpass them. And so you have all the same resources that I have. Um, you literally have the same resources that I have. So um, be inspired and just lastly, just take action. Um, the biggest thing who I see kills dreams are people who just don't take action. Like the same thing with courses. I see so many people buy the course and never finish it. Or so some people buy the course and never log in. Like, how are you going to do anything? Or they watch the video and never do anything. Like the information's only going to take you so far. Action is actually what's most important. And so um, I've shared how I was able to just launch one product and take that to the six figure level. And so don't think you need to just be doing everything or just binge watch the course and just go through the information and try to do everything. 
just start where you are and just take it one step at a time. But make sure that it's more important. Make sure you understand it's more important to take action than just to consume information. Thank you so much for sharing because I do agree and everyone is open to the exact same advice and exact same learnings that you went through. And you know, the saying is you are the best reflection of the closest five people you surround yourself with. So if you are in that mindset, surround yourself with those sort of people that are aiming big, like you mentioned that student who I, I'm definitely aware of that was doing $3 million a month. It's just incredible. And I think having the right mindset is a massive, massive thing. And lastly, the question I'd like to ask you if, if someone is on the fence about purchasing the Start and Scale course or launching a business, what would be the advice that you would give them? If you're considering joining this course or just any info product in general, um, it's important that you set realistic expectations. Like, you know, your outcome may not be as, um, as good or the same as mine or some of the other uh, testimonials, but understand that we have access to the same information that you're going to have access to. Like that is absolutely true. Like we didn't get like this certain information that you're not going to access, get access to. And so if you believe in yourself and um, want to go on this journey and you're serious about it, you should always bet on yourself. And so by investing in this course or any course for that matter, it's not that you are investing in Greta and you Greta better make you a millionaire. You are investing that if you get access to the same information that we have access to, that you do the work to get the results. I am very confident that you will learn stuff that you don't know and the things that you learn will get you in a better place. And um, so that's one. And the second thing is that there's so many people out there faking it and um, just making stuff up just to appeal to you and to try to sell you things. There's a big difference between people who are teaching theory about e-commerce versus someone who's actually lived it. And from all of the investing that I've done, this is an amazing community of real people who are leading you, who actually are in their business each day, building it. And so you're learning from people's real experience. It's not in theory. It makes a difference. And um, so much so that I've actually bought multiple products from you. So if Start and Scale isn't the one for you, like they have other things that are an amazing course. I think Start and Scale is an amazing foundation for people to start and take you from idea phase to generating revenue fairly quickly. And, um, you know, I believe so much in what I've learned that I've actually given you money multiple times. And so that should be a testament to just the quality of the information I've received and just have been loved and felt a part and supported in this community. So stop thinking and just do it. If you believe in yourself, like stop talking and hit the button and buy it. Incredible. Thank you so much, Gamal, for sitting down and sharing your story with with everyone listening and myself and talking about Fresh Heritage and the massive success you've had. And I wish you nothing but the best for your future and, and those goals to, you know, grow Fresh Heritage to beyond your wildest imagination. So thank you again. And uh, I appreciate the time you spent with me. I appreciate you, Molly. Thanks for having me on. Hey guys, we hope you're loving From Zero to Founder and you're getting a ton of value from it. If you want access to the exact free training that led today's founder to where they are now, head to founder.com slash e-commerce training or follow the link in the show notes.